we will now continue our discussion on the phase lock loop that we have uh, started last time. To recap we had looked at the steady state operation of the phase lock loop that is assuming that the loop is in lock we had argued that under such a condition the in instantaneous phase of the VCO output of the loop would follow the uh, incoming phase right we will track the incoming phase. In the process the derivative of the input phase d phi by dt and the derivative of the VCO phase would be nearly would be nearly the same right and therefore the VCO input voltage could be considered to be the a replica of the modulating signal that we wanted to get from the demodulator right. So that was one part of the discussion that we had to demonstrate that in the steady state the if you if you tap the VCO uh, if, you, if you tap the phase lock loop at the input to the VCO or after the loop filter right after the amplifier then that output can be considered to be a demodulated output for the FM signal for the angle modulated signal that particularly for the FM signal that is under consideration right. That was the first part the second part was to try to figure out how the locking actually occurs right. Now in this case we have to go through a nonlinear uh, model of the loop right because uh, we we found that the phase lock loop actually is a nonlinear system right it is in fact we obtained a differential equation description for the operation of the phase lock loop right. In particular we arrived at this nonlinear differential equation which specifies the instantaneous phase error between the incoming phase and the uh, VC output phase right. So we found that this phase error follows this nonlinear differential equation right and we try to look at the operation of the phase lock loop by considering what does this differential equation imply in terms of its operation right and to do that we took recourse to a graphical picture graphical depiction of this differential equation through the so called phase plane plot right. In the phase plane plot uh, basically we plot d psi by dt versus psi, psi of t right. So this uh, obviously becomes a sinusoidal function with the peak occurring when sin of psi of t is either plus 1 or minus 1 right. When it is plus 1 this this gives you delta omega minus kt that is the negative peak and when it is minus 1 this gives you the peak value as delta omega plus k of t which is the positive peak and at psi equal to 0 this point intersects the d psi by dt axis at delta omega right because at that point psi is 0 so d psi by dt is equal to delta omega. So this was a phase plane plot and then we discussed that this phase plane plot essentially gives you the trajectory of the operating point of the phase lock loop right in the sense for example if initially you are somewhere here on the trajectory initially assuming that the steady state phase error was 0 somehow initially when the we consider the case when all this discussion we did in the context of a step input in the frequency of the incoming signal right as if your modulating signal was a unit step function right of course we, we can we cannot do it in a general we cannot plot the phase plane plot for the general signal we have to do it for a specific signal and the specific signal we considered was a unit step function right. So for this case assuming that initially the loop was in lock at the carrier frequency we found that the loop will eventually the it will move the operating point will move on this trajectory to the right right and the second important point is the motion on this trajectory will be to the right if you are in the upper half plane of the trajectory the motion will be to the left if you are in the lower half plane of the trajectory and based on these arguments we uh, concluded that this point A is a stable operating point of the loop which means that after the frequency step has been applied 
the loop will eventually try to come to this condition right because at this point d psi by dt becomes 0 that means there is no further movement in the operating point because there is no uh, derivative there is no slope psi as a function of uh, time becomes a constant value right and the constant value is this value whatever is the value here this is psi axis so whatever is the value of psi at this point is the steady state value of the phase error right. So there will be many such points. There will, be, there, will, uh, there will be many such points but they are all periodically placed right the next such point will be at this phase this value plus 2 pi right. So in, a, in, in as much as phase is anyway uh, more specified modulo 2 pi it does not really matter which point you lock on to it hardly matters phase error you cannot uh, distinguish between a phase error which is of 1 degree or 361 degrees it is really the same thing right. So that does not really matter okay. So uh, we now proceed further and just do a further little bit of discussion on the uh, phase on this uh, what we get from this phase plane plot. Let us call the steady state phase error of let us denote it by psi sub s s right and of course we said that the steady state fre frequency error would be 0 sorry that is frequency error. Can you tell me what is the value of psi sub psi s s is it possible to uh, see it from this equation or this plot if you look at this equation once again at the operate at the stable po point what is the value of d psi by dt that is equal to 0 right. So put that equal to 0 you can solve for the corresponding value of psi right that will be sin inverse of delta omega by k t. So this will be sin inverse of delta omega by k sub t right this one. Now what does it show? It shows some very important facts that if you want this steady state phase error to be small what should happen? k t should be large for a given frequency step at the input if you want this steady state phase error to be small this argument should be small which will happen. So for a small value of psi s s k t should be large and what is k sub t if you remember it is the loop gain right is not it. So basically we are saying that we require a large value for the loop gain. Now we require a large value of the loop gain not only for this purpose but for another very important reason right. Uh, let us see all this discussion was nicely concluded and we, uh, we could demonstrate through the phase plane plot that indeed the loop will lock right in as much as the phase error does come to a small value it does not become 0 of course if you wanted to make, make it 0 if you want to make the steady state phase error equal to 0 you should have a loop gain of infinity right you must have a very very large value of the loop gain. So the larger the value of the loop gain the smaller you can make the steady state phase error right but nevertheless whether large or small loop gain the important point was that for it to be, be come to the stable point it should have a stable point is not it. Now is there a situation where a stable point may not be there at all when delta minus k t is a positive number right. So I, as I, in, in that case this phase plane plot this curve will not intersect this i axis at all and you will always be in the positive half plane the loop will the trajectory of the operating point will always keep on moving the operating point will not be able to find a point at which it can stabilize. 
will keep on attempting to lock, but will never really be able to lock. Right? This is a very in interesting uh, way of looking at it. Right? So the second important thing to note is that for the lock to occur, so this was let us say the first point, the value of the steady state phase error, for the lock to occur, the phase plane trajectory or phase plane curve should intersect the psi axis. Right? And in order for that to happen, what do you need? You need to make sure that delta omega minus k sub t is less than 0. Right? The negative peak of this curve should be negative, I mean the lower peak of this q should be negative, which implies that delta omega should be less than the loop gain. So, loop gain plays a very important role in the operation of this system. Right? Number one, a large value of the loop gain will imply a small value of the phase steady state phase error. A large value of the loop gain will also imply a large value of the what is called log range of the loop. Right? So, loop gain in a way decides what is called the log range or locking range of the PLL because locking range of the PLL is the maximum frequency step that you can apply uh, that you can uh, have at the input and still the loop is able to produce a steady state situation where the frequency error is 0 that is the VCO exactly locks to the input signal frequency. Right? So, locking range of the PLL is equal to k sub t and uh, large lock range requires that you choose a large value of k t. Let me, let me summarize this discussion by showing you a plotting a set of phase plane curves for different values of k sub t uh, for, for sorry for different values of uh, delta omega or delta f right. Let us for this discussion assume that your loop gain is has some fixed value let us uh, arbitrarily chosen the fixed value to be 2 pi into 50. Right. So, let us consider a phase lock loop in which the loop gain has this value. Right. So, let me now plot the phase plane plots for a dis for different sets of delta omega. Right. So, when I choose let us say delta f equal to 55 hertz, right. let us say apply a frequency step of a frequency step of 55 hertz to the input. Initially, the loop is in lock and you apply a frequency step of 55 hertz which means delta omega is 2 pi into 55 right. So, this condition is not satisfied which means the loop will not the, the trajectory will not intersect the psi axis you will get something like this right sorry you will get something like that it will not intersect the psi axis at all. Suppose you make it 48 hertz, it will almost just intersect now, right? but intersect it will. So, you will now be in a situation like that, etcetera. Right? So, a stable operating point will exist, but the corresponding steady state error would be quite large. Right? If you make it half of this, so this is 55 hertz, this is 48 if I make it half of this as you can see the steady state phase error will come down accordingly. If I have it further it will come down further right. So, this is a sequence of curves that I have plotted for, for delta f equal to 55 hertz, 48 hertz then 24 hertz and 12 hertz. Okay. 
So, this picture says it all, it demonstrates very clearly that as you increase the loop gain you get better and better performance from the phase lock loop. Any questions here? Sorry? No. <coughs> the same thing will apply, if you think about it. The frequency step in either direction would imply the same thing. Okay. Yeah, in a way you are saying, okay, well if in a, I agree with you, what, what you are saying is precisely the same thing. What I said. Thank you. Yeah, you can make it del delta omega mod because <coughs> positive or frequency negative step, the only the rows will get into exchange. Okay. So, uh, that also means something else, that means even in the steady state, I cannot always use the linear approximation that I discussed earlier, do you agree? That because for linear approximation to be valid, what is the assumption that you made? That psi of t is very small, but suppose your, uh, psi, your loop gain is not very large and delta omega is quite large, right, you could have a very large value of the steady state phase error and therefore in uh, for that value of the steady state phase error I cannot assume sin of psi of t is equal to psi of t right. So, the linear approximation that we considered would not be available for use even in the steady state if your steady state phase error is not very small right. So, it is therefore imperative that if you want to use linear approximation in the steady state that this is so. Now, and it is, it is useful to look at that small signal approximation, uh, small phase error approximation or linear approximation uh, to study the steady state behavior of the loop, right, Ap at least approximate behavior if not exact. So, when psi s s is small, we can use the linear approximation. can be used for analysis. Uh, what does it mean? If you remember your final equation we, from which we derived the differential equation was that theta of t was equal to k sub t integral of theta of t is the instantaneous phase of the VCO output. Right. This was this was equal to k sub t times here it was sin of phi alpha minus theta alpha t alpha. And if you are going to use a linear approximation, that sign can be removed and you can simply write it as phi of alpha minus theta of alpha d alpha. Right. And if you were to convert this into the corresponding differential equation this will become d theta by d t plus k t theta t. So, instead of sin theta t you have k t theta t is equal to uh, instead of k t sin psi t right you can write this k t phi of t. Now, this is a linear differential equation. So, when you when the linear approximation is valid the loop is now described at or near the steady state by a linear differential equation, right. And when that is so, it is possible to study it uh, much more conveniently because we know how to study dif this linear differential equation let us say by Laplace transforms. In fact, we can obtain a transfer function model of the loop, right. For example, I could define a loop transfer function sometimes also called the closed loop transfer function with uh, uh, as a ratio of the Laplace transform of the output and the input. And what is the output here? Output is theta of t, the final phase of the VCO, 
right and the input is phi of t the incoming phase function right. So I define the loop transfer function h of s as theta of s upon phi of s. definition of any uh, lap, uh, any transfer function is Laplace transform of the output divided by Laplace transform of the input right that is what we are doing we are considering the VCO output as VCO output phase as the output here taking the Laplace transform of that the input is the input incoming phase function which is phi of t Laplace transform of that is phi of s okay. So what, what will be the value of the transfer function here you can derive it from here by just taking the Laplace transform of both the sides. Can you tell me what will be the value of theta s upon phi s from this differential equation? It will be simply k sub t upon s plus k sub t, right? And the corresponding h t, the corresponding impulse response, you can write as k sub t e to the power minus k sub t into t u t. that shows that a unit step at the input does not produce a unit step at the output immediately it goes through the exponential function sorry an impulse function at the input not unit step this is an impulse response an impulse function at the input does not produce an impulse function in terms of uh, uh, at the output but some, some other impulse some response which is an exponentially decaying response right. This will ideally if you do not want the system to do any distortion of any kind uh, then this then this h of t should be equal to delta t itself right. Under what conditions will this converge to delta t when k t becomes very large. So h t will converge to delta t or will tend towards delta t as k t tends to infinity right and when that happens right when that happens your theta of t would be the same thing as phi of t right there will be no phase error for large loop k. So no matter how you look at it you reach the same result. Okay. Before we uh, proceed further suppose I, I ask you the question that I want to use the PLL for demodulating phase modulation signals, phase modulated signals what will I do, how should I do that, hmm? demodulation of PM signals, what is the answer? You should integrate the output of the demodulator of which FM demodulator, right? So just in take the integral of uh, integral of E sub t. So integrate E sub v t. That will produce the required demodulator output. That's true for any, you know, you have the FM demodulator output, and if you want to demodulate a phase modulated signal, you just have to integrate the output of the FM demodulator, right? Standard result. Some final remarks before we uh, go on to some other discussion of the uh, PLL. Uh, yes, is there a question? Okay. So what we notice from this discussion is that a large loop gain is crucial, right? Large loop gain, incidentally, if you look at this transfer function, I can think of suppose you think of this transfer function purely as a filter right what is the bandwidth of this filter let us say the 3 dB bandwidth I am looking at the loop func transfer function as a filter 
right you have a transfer function k t upon s plus k t what is the 3 degree point of this transfer function it is a low pass function you can see that is not it as uh, omega increases the function the value will come down right it, the, it will attenuate the signal more and more what is the 3 degree, 3 degree point s is equal to k t right so you can think of k t as the 3 dB bandwidth of the loop right or k sub t is also so k sub t has a lot of significance k sub t is the log range k sub t decides the steady state value of the phase error k sub t can also be considered to be, to be what is called the loop bandwidth right so k sub t can also be considered to be in this particular case the loop bandwidth So what we are saying is that if you want a large, uh, if you want a good uh, performance from the phase lock loop in terms of steady state phase error, in terms of uh, lock range and consequently in terms of demodulation of FM signals, right? you would require either a large loop gain or equivalently a large loop bandwidth. Right? Now that is uh, usually so if you if you want to the PLL to work properly as an FM demodulator, again you want large value of K sub. These are the conclusions we have reached. Now large loop gain is not always possible. Right, it's very difficult. Um, it also has some problems associated with it, right? Which we'll not go into right now. But it's usually not easy to realize a very large loop gain. So uh, we need to think of uh, improving the performance when we don't have sufficiently large loop gain, right? And one way of improving the performance is to, in, you know, remember this loop that this analysis that we have done is for a very specific situation when we have removed the loop filter right so one of the advantages of using the loop filter uh, including the loop filters is that we can relax on this condition that we have on the loop gain right so loop presence of loop filters helps Only thing is, the moment we have loop filters, our analysis becomes much more complex, isn't it? Because I can no longer write that uh, differential equation so easily. I have to also consider the, how the filter affects the differential equation. Right? So far, the phase detector output, except for the uh, multiplication by the loop gain, was directly going into the VCO input. Right? So it was very easy to relate the VCO phase output to the input. Right. It was very easy through that integral or through the differential equation. The moment you have an additional filter coming between these two, you have to also see how that affects the entire uh, description in terms of either differential equation or integral equation. <coughs> it is not that it cannot be done, it just becomes a little more complicated <coughs> and at the moment we will not go into that. But we will have a very brief discussion of the uh, at least one more loop with, with a loop filter. Now the second remark is look at the value of k sub t it is given by i don't remember the exact value it is half ac av k sub d anything else mu there are so many factors which determine the value of the loop gain what does it mean if you first of all the input signal amplitude itself has a effect on the loop gain right now other things of course are more or less constant of the PLL itself. AV is associated with the VCO, K sub D is associated with the phase detector, U is the gain that you have incorporated in the phase lock loop. Right? So these three are constants of the loop but A sub C is a constant associated with the input signal. Now that is not a very nice thing to have. You do not want a loop design to be dependent on the amplitude of the input signal because if that is so. When the input signal has a weak amplitude, the loop gain goes down. Input signal has a stronger amplitude, 
the loop gain goes up right that is not very desi desirable. So dependence of because otherwise what you have to do is you have to design the loop for operating with a certain signal amplitude right and if the signal amplitude changes your value of uh, k sub t changes and then your all your design is gone right. So dependence of design on input amplitude not desirable. Can you suggest a way of take, uh, removing this dependence? We ensure that the input signal always has a constant amplitude right. Input FM signal always has a constant amplitude and we know what one method of doing that the band pass limiter. So we can proceed the PLL by a band pass limiter. Good, that's a very good answer. Okay. Good question. I think I. I forgot to mention that the, the question let me repeat the question uh, for this complete discussion I have taken the input signal to be a cosine function and the phase modulator function uh, the VC output to be a sine function right why did I do that can you see the hmm? that is right because I am how am I realize it depends on how you realize your phase detector I am realizing the phase detector by multiplying the two signals and low pass filtering the output right. When I multiply cosine with sine I will get a, um, the difference the difference component it will be sine. If I on the other hand multiply cosine with cosine the difference frequency function uh, function the fre difference function will be a cosine function. A cosine function will not be sensitive to the sine of the phase error right. It will only depend it will only de decide, decide the magnitude of the phase error and you cannot track the uh, the phase lock loop will not be able to work properly because it must not only know what is the phase error so that the phase error can be driven to zero it must also know whether the phase error is positive or negative right you want to be sensitive to the phase error right so uh, it is important that this work so it automatically works like that right so in a lock condition it is implied that if the input signal is cosine the output signal will be sine that is there will be a pi by 2 phase shift between the input signal and the demodulated signal right. So the input carrier is cosine to pi of ct the VC output will be sine to pi of ct right. This will automatically happen because it is in a closed loop and the closed loop will work like that okay. That was a good question about, I, I forgot to mention about that earlier okay. Now what can we do about the removal of these disadvantages of the first the loop the first order loop right this loop that we discussed is called the first order loop right. So uh, loop the PLL without the loop filter now can you also see why it is called the first order loop that is one way of looking at it and another consequence of that is that the transfer function that we had the loop transfer function kt upon s plus kt is a first order transfer function right. So that is why we call it a first order loop right. Uh, it has the disadvantages that we already seen the two basic disadvantages which lead to non optimum performance one is a limited lock range. And the second is a non zero steady state phase error. Right? These are the two disadvantages that we have discussed. Can we do something about it? As I mentioned, we can try to remove both these advantages by using a loop filter and of an appropriate kind. To illustrate that that can be done, that it indeed happens. Let us consider a loop 
in which we choose a loop filter with a transfer function like this. This is the transfer function not of the loop but of the filter in the loop that we are going to put right which we had omitted in this discussion right. Uh, this is as you can see essentially an integrator right. The second part A by S is an integrator right. The first part is 1 uh, which allows the input signal to just go out right. The, such an integrator is called a leaky integrator right because it allows the input signal to leak through to the output as well as a component will come after integration right. So this is essentially what is called a leaky integrator. So basically uh, your linear model let us consider the linear model for simple simplicity of discussion because the non-linear model will become very complex now right. The phase plane plot the, the differential equation will be a second order differential equation now right because if one, if one order of differential equation will be contributed by the uh, loop filter and one order of the differential equation will be contributed by the relationship between the VCO output and the VCO input right because there is an integral relationship there right. So this will become a second order differential equation and the phase plane plot will be much more complex now right we will not go into all that discussion we will consider the steady state operation right and at least through uh, prove through steady state arguments that indeed it is now possible to get both these things that we are looking for right. So we will we will look at that. So we can decide the signal in So why are you calling it No, uh, ideally we would not like to have any phase error but after, after, after the locking has occurred. As long as the phase error is there, we, we should know whether it is positive or negative so that the loop can operate itself to drive the phase error to 0. The ultimate goal of the phase lock loop and that is why it is so called is to drive the phase error to 0. Right? In, by in whichever direction in the current phase error may be. I thought I had already answered that question. If you still have a doubt, we will discuss it separately in this tutorial. Right? Okay. Uh, let me return to this. So let me consider the uh, small error model or the linear model for this case right. So what is the linear model for this case? We have this. I have removed the sinusoidal nonlinearity here because I am considering the linear model. Input is uh, phi of s, the VCO output is theta of s, right. This is the loop gain, I am denoting it by a block, and what we have now introduced additionally is a loop filter with transfer function f of s as given. The output of this is fed to the VCO, and the VCO here will be represented by a transfer function of 1 by s it is an integrator right. So its transfer function is 1 by s and you are taking your demodulated output here, here over here right. So what is the closed loop transfer function here h of s equal to theta of s upon phi of s we need to find that out right. To do that so we need to find this to to do that let us proceed step by step let us write an expression for theta of s which is equal to can I write it in terms of this point here suppose I go through the loop like this it is k t times f s times uh, into 1 by s of the Fourier transform of the signal here and what is that phi f s minus theta of s. So basically it is k sub t into f s upon s 
of phi of s minus theta of s right just written the transfer function it is a cascade of three functions. Now you can solve for theta of s take this theta of s to the left hand side and solve for that. So if you do that and compute theta s upon phi of s it is very easy to do that so I will leave that as an exercise you can check this out that this becomes equal to k t times f s upon s plus k t times f s right and substitute for f of s as equal to s plus a upon s this becomes k t times s plus a upon s square plus k sub t s plus k sub t a okay. So that is what you have here. So it becomes a second order loop because your transfer function is a second order transfer function right. So when you use a first order filter as a loop filter this is a first order filter the loop becomes a second order filter a uh, second, second order loop right. The loop transfer function it has a denominator degree which is 2 right okay. We are interested to look at the phase error. So it will be interesting to look at <coughs> psi of s the phase error the phase error is phi of s minus theta of s. So if I were to consider the transfer function let us say between psi of s and in the input phi of s that will become 1 minus h of s if I divide both sides with phi of s right and if I do that you can see that if I substitute for h of s from the expression that we just derived this expression here this will become s square upon the same denominator as before s square plus k t s k t a s plus k t a. Okay, it will be KTS. So I'll rewrite it. S square by S square plus K sub T S plus K sub T. Right. Okay. Now from this, can I say something about the steady state phase error? From this transfer function, is it possible to say something about the steady state phase error even without going through that nonlinear analysis? There is a final value theorem that you have, right, in Laplace transforms. What is the final value theorem? Suppose I want to find limit of psi of t as t tends to infinity, right. This is limit of s tends to 0 of s time psi of s. Of course to do that I must first consider some kind of input right I have to say something about phi of s let us consider the same kind of input that we were talking about earlier let us say that the input is a frequency step right. So if the input is a frequency step what can you say about phi of t the input frequency is a frequency step what happens to the phase will be an integral of that right the phase will be integral of the uh, phi, uh, d phi by dt d phi by dt has a fre frequency step right. So phi of t or rather phi of s what can you say about phi of s so for a, for a frequency step input <coughs> with a frequency step of delta omega right you can say that phi of s is nothing but see frequency step step itself 
means that the Laplace transform of this would be delta omega by s right. Laplace transform of the integral of that would be delta omega by s square. So, phi of s will become delta omega by s square are you with me on this all of you the frequency step that is your d phi by dt is delta omega ut right that is what a frequency step at the input means right. So therefore phi of t would be integral of this and the Laplace transform of this is delta omega by s because Laplace transform of ut is 1 by s right. Laplace transform of phi of t will be another multiplication of 1 by s. So that becomes delta by delta omega by s square. So now substituting that in the expression for psi s upon phi s and taking phi s on the right hand side what do you get psi of s would be equal to 1 upon s square plus k t s plus k t a okay. And now take the limit of s psi of s as s tends to 0 what do you get it becomes 0 right. So in this implies that the steady state phase error is right because this is nothing but what you want limit t tends to infinity of psi of t. So the steady state phase error is equal to 0. Similarly you can argue I leave that as an exercise for you to complete that the steady state frequency error would be 0 in fact that is trivially obvious from this because frequency error is going to be derivative of the phase error right. So if this is 0 that will also be 0 okay. So a second order loop removes both the disadvantages of the first order loop right. However the only difficulty is the complexity of analysis this analysis that we have done is a very approximate linear analysis which is valid around the locking situation when the loop is nearly in the lock so that the linear approximation can be assumed to be valid. Otherwise the proper nonlinear analysis which will of course lead you to the same conclusion right would actually show much more clearly how the locking actually occurs because you will have to be able to again see that how the track operating point varies as a function of uh, let us say psi right. In this case you will find that the uh, phase plane plot is not a very simple sinusoidal curve it is a very complex curve and it does not uh, it is a it is a it is typically sinusoidal curve which gradually keeps on approaching the psi axis right and eventually meets or cuts the psi axis at, at a fair good amount of distance after going through many many cycles right rather than every cycle. The, in the first order loop the phase plane plot was uh, the sinusoidal curve was intersecting the psi axis every cycle every 2 pi radians right that will not happen there right. So the actual nonlinear analysis will show all that that there is a lot of what is called cycle slipping taking, taking place before the lock actually occurs. But I am skipping all that analysis we do not have time for all that it is a very detailed treatment of the phase lock loop which you can if you are interested learn by yourself it is a very complex uh, system to study because it is a nonlinear system okay. So I think that is a sufficient discussion for the phase lock loop but this is not the only kind of feedback demodulator we can have for frequency modulation right. There is another very interesting variant of phase lock loop which is often used in uh, for demodulating FM signals more or less for the same purpose that the, FM, uh, for that the PLL is used right. It is called system with frequency compressive feedback It is very similar to a phase lock loop but there is there are some major differences. Let us look at the block diagram you have an input signal x, x sub rt I have a multiplier I do not call it a phase detector anymore 
I call it a multiplier. I had the phase detector also as a multiplier, but that was followed by a low pass filter, right? So that to make the phase detector, right? I will not follow it up with a low pass filter. I'll follow it up with a band pass filter. Now that may be very surprising, and uh, because this, this will not make sense if the carrier frequency here and here are same, isn't it? Because if the carrier frequency here and here are same, then the difference component will always be proportional. Will always be centered around zero, right? So I don't uh, bandpass filter sub will serve no purpose. So it obviously implies that the VCO output here is not at the same carrier frequency as the input, or in the lock condition also, it is at a different carrier frequency. Right? Whereas in the phase lock loop, the carrier frequency of the VCO under the lock conditions will be the same as that of the input signal. So therefore, it is implied here that the VCO works differently here. Now, what will happen then that you will have a signal here which is at a some finite carrier frequency, which will depend on the center frequency of this bandpass filter, and will depend on the frequency of the VCO here, right? This I'll follow it up with discriminator again. It's a very intriguing kind of structure, and all kinds of questions should come to your mind when I'm plotting this. And here is the demodulated output, and here is the feedback loop, which contains the VCO again. Okay. Where the center frequency of the VCO is uh, omega c minus omega zero, and the bandpass filter has a center frequency of omega zero. Okay. So we will once again call it E sub VT, E sub OT and now there must be a lot of questions in your mind. I have a discriminator in this loop right and a natural question that will arise is if I am going to use a discriminator anyway inside the loop why should I have this device at all right. I could as well st d straight away use a frequency discriminator and demodulate my FM signal. So why all this complicated? So how this works and what are the advantages of this structure over this simple straightforward discriminator are issues that we will discuss in the next class. Thank you very much. <laughs>